CEO Dashboard Cooperation. Uh, previously, she served as a project official with the European Union Satellite Center, developing solutions for geointelligence, and also has a PhD in SAR image information mining and stochastic analysis. So, Anka, if you're ready, you can uh, share your screen. Um, can you see my screen already? Um, not yet. Okay. Okay. Can no, you see? I don't think. Mm. Oh yeah, I think. Okay, now it appeared. Yeah. Okay. Great. So thanks okay. so much. Uh, can I start? Ah, uh, yes, please, you can start. Okay, thanks so much, Nicolina, for the introduction. Uh, and thanks for, for being here to, to listen to this talk. So um, I will present today the project called Rapid Action on COVID-19 and Earth Observation. I'd just like to say that um, this is a collaborative project. So I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues, first Patrick Griffiths and Stefan Meisel, who you see also on this um, slide, but also the large number of contributors from European industry, European Commission, uh, Copernicus services, and so forth. So just a brief um, introduction to the project. Um, this project was started last year um, on the onset of the pandemic. And it's a joint initiative of ESA, so the European Space Agency and the European Commission. And the scope was to um, act pretty fast uh, to try to see um, whether Earth observations could be used to measure or understand at least the um, impacts of the pandemic on different aspects of the, of the society, economy, agriculture and so forth and to communicate these findings to the general public and potentially also decision makers. So we had four uh, main focus areas, uh, climate, environment, economy and agriculture to start with. And the objective was to try to launch in a relatively short time um, a public platform using open source technologies um, based on data that comes mostly from the Copernicus Sentinels as well as third party missions through the EarthNet program. Um, using, of course, the platforms that ESA um, has been developing in the late, in the last years um, and machine learning and AI to extract information from our observation data. So this project was launched um, in um, early June 2020 and has been ongoing since. Um, it's available at raise.isa.int and you have the GitHub um, URL as well on, on the screen. And currently it has reached people in over 127 countries. Um, and that was uh, quite um, good news for us. So <clears throat> the main question that was, uh, let's say our starting point was how to get from the, the large amount of um, Earth observation data that we had available together with other sources of information, transform them um, and extract let's say relevant um, actionable information that can be easy to interpret, easy to understand by the general public and how to do this very fast. So we aimed to build um, a product that could give, um, let's say, a first impression view of what is happening uh, due to COVID with our society. Uh, luckily, we had um, already available um, a number of um, act activities um, within ESA, within our um, Department of um, um, Data Applications, with a number of industrial actors. So this is largely a, um, a collaborative project. And through these um, different actions that we had already ongoing, we were able to, let's say, distribute the workload and produce this um, platform that you should be um, seeing on the screen. Um, basically, um, what this platform does is um, a web application that has this um, a central um, map and a number of filters that you could see um, before. Um, and you can browse by country and by number of economic, agriculture and uh, environmental indicators. 
um, all of the information being derived from Earth observation data. You can scroll through the locations, um, um, inspect the various indicators. For example, this one that is shown on the screen right now is actually data that is not coming from Earth observation. It's um, it comes from uh, Google, it's mobility data, so integrate a lot of different different data sources um, and try to put everything within a context. We have also three community contributions, so this is an open source project and we've launched a number of competitions since last year and continuing also this year. Uh, competitions where uh, participants can reuse the resources that we uh, ourselves um, are using to develop the project and try to propose um, additional information that could be added um, to, the, to this dashboard. So one of the um, key assets that um, enabled the development of this project was the uh, Eurodata Cube. So the Eurodata Cube is what we call the EO Information Factory. And it's, in essence, a platform technology. Um, so it's um, the Eurodata Data Cube itself sits, sits on top of cloud infrastructure. So it's um, uh, using uh, the DSs, but also AWS. And it's interfacing with a lot of different um, other platforms that are providing different data sources, different types of data. So we have in situ data, um, um, as well as OpenStreetMap, but also a lot of a lot of various um, different providers. On top of that, uh, we have a number of services that enable not only the data access but also processing um, as well on the fly. Uh, we have vector data service. We have the possibility to um, develop and run applications. And finally, um, uh, the whole system is interoperable and um, exposes the information via APIs, uses um, OGC um, standards. So um, the information can be easily transferred from one system to the other. Uh, so the main uh, data sources that we used, um, first of all, uh, we had the Copernicus services, uh, the Copernicus Sentinels. Um, so basically the indicators that we show on the platform are derived from Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, and Sentinel-5P. Uh, but also um, a number of indicators rely on higher resolution data that comes mostly from third-party missions such as um, ISI, for example, or Pleiad. Uh, we have integrated as well contributions from a number of Copernicus services, um, atmosphere uh, monitoring service and the marine service, and as well a number of other open data sources, including statistical data, health data, um, mobility, uh, and so forth. We do have um, some indicators that have, um, let's say, underlying um, non-open data, such as AIS or mobile analytics. Uh, but um, the majority of the data is open. So just to give a few examples on what kind of indicators we show, um, one of the most known environmental indicators that we show relates to air quality. So this is an indicator that was produced um, by a number of actors that you see here on, on the screen. You can see their logos here as well as, um, and let's say complemented by um, data that comes from ECMWF. Uh, so here we relied on uh, data from Sentinel-5P um, and the processing services from the Eurodata Cube and the statistical API to produce global maps and citywide air quality trends. So global maps such as this one that you see on the screen um, where um, users can inspect, so they can browse through time and can inspect the differences in the concentrations of NO2 as well as CO, CO was ad added later on. And um, what I would like to point out is that besides these maps, we also, um, um, so the users have also the possibility to generate their own time series using the statistical um, API from the Eurodata Cube. Uh, so this um, statistical API basically enables us to um, compute um, statistical analysis for a long time series and to provide based on a given geometry and the selection of statistical measures to compute that um, those statistical measures for the um, Earth observation data that is in the back. Um, just to show you how this looks on the platform, so um, over the map view, um, the user can just uh, draw an area of interest 
And then by um, pressing this little chart button here, they activate the statistical API. And the return of the API is um, uh, basically the different statistical measures that are then plotted on the interface. Uh, another example is on water quality. So here, um, the teams of um, CNR produced um, um, chlorophyll concentration and total suspended, suspended matter maps based on Sentinel-3 data, as well as station data. So maps, uh, so, sorry, um, apart from the, from the maps, we also include uh, time series, um, such as this one, where uh, users can inspect interactively uh, what is the weekly climatology. Here, we refer to chlorophyll concentration and compare uh, for the different dates um, whether the water quality was higher or lower than the expected value. Um, um, a ex short example of um, um, indicators that are using also machine learning. Um, together with platform um, technologies. So this is an indicator that shows the variation in the number of parked airplanes on Sentinel-2 data. Um, the um, indicator is produced for around 40 um, airports uh, distributed across Europe. And um, apart from the interactive charts um, that show whether um, the number of parked planes is higher or lower or normal compared to a given baseline, um, the user can also um, understand whether this um, effect is due to COVID or not. So the back on the back of the, of the charts, we display the periods of lockdown uh, that are taken from the open data provided by Oxford on the um, COVID-19 stringency index. And um, finally, um, the users can inspect as well for each of the dates um, on a map uh, the detections that were um, retrieved by the machine learning algorithm. It's based on Sentinel-2 data, so we're really reaching the limit of the detection with this, uh, with this indicator. Uh, I will just uh, um, present briefly two of the newest indicators that we've released. So this is an agriculture indicator that was produced by um, uh, colleagues in Vista and contributors to the Food Security Thematic Exploitation Platform. Uh, so this is an indicator that is uh, presented for 19 European countries, and it shows um, the, um, on the same chart um, the um, ver evolution of the harvesting um, as it would be expected based on the Ypsilon platform of Vista compared to what was observed uh, by using Sentinel-1 uh, backscatter and coherence information. And this is done for winter cereals and winter rapeseed. Um, Finally, um, one of the latest releases refers to um, an indicator, an economic indicator that presents um, crude oil storage um, across four European clusters. So these clusters are um, the UK and Ireland cluster, the Northern Europe, including Belgium, Netherlands, and Western Germany, Central Eastern Europe uh, with Croatia, Austria, and Northeastern Italy, and Southern Europe. Uh, so. This indicator is a composite indicator that uses um, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data, uh, as well as additional um, root information and um, AIS data. So what we show um, on the platform are the different uh, sites uh, that are part of the, of the different clusters. And for each of these sites, uh, users can uh, then retrieve graphs such as this one, where we show in the continuous black line, the monthly cluster storage average, and then with the different colored dots, the, um, how, that, how that particular site um, um, is, also the status of that particular site with respect to the cluster. So for this um, chart that I've shown here, that is in the northeast of Italy, at least in uh, Croatia and Om Omisaj, uh, we can see um, during some stringency, some um, uh, lockdown period in Croatia, that the cluster, the level of the oil in the cluster in that specific uh, site was much higher, which means that the trade was not um, um, as expected. 
Um, just to show you two of the community contributions and to tell you that you can learn more about this if you participate in the ESA Fee Week that is taking place on um, the 5th, 5th, um, 11th to the 15th of October. Um, so this is a community contribution that was selected as part of a contest uh, last year. It is a flying plane detection based on Sentinel-2 that exploits this artifact, um, this rainbow effect that is created by moving targets at a given altitude in the Sentinel-2 imagery. So this is an indicator um, of um, uh, transportation, so mobility, uh, and can be relevant for COVID um, by helping us understand how the disease uh, spreads or if the containment measures were effective and so forth. Uh, it, it relies, um, so the, the development of this, um, of this indicator relies as well on uh, a lot of open data, not just from the Sentinels, so Sentinel-2, but also open sky data that was used for validation. Finally, um, we have uh, a second community contribution that is uh, exploiting the effect uh, Sentinel-2 data, this time for targets that are moving on the ground and that are um, um, large enough to be detected, such as trucks. So we have this indicator developed um, for the whole um, Europe, and I will just show you how it works and how, again, the use of the um, um, Eurodata Cube uh, platform uh, to generate um, time series on the fly. So um, what we include here is a map where the user can draw an area of interest and can generate for that area of interest uh, a chart. Uh, it's a comparative chart showing the number of trucks that were detected for that area, so on that road, on that highway, uh, between 2017 and 2020. Uh, and then the individual detections can be also displayed or inspected. Uh, so again, you can learn more about this indicator uh, by um, taking part in the fee week. Uh, there is a side event on the 15th of October starting at 11 a.m. So you can register for free here. Um, finally, um, I would like to point out a collaborative feature that we've recently released. Uh, it's called the custom dashboard. So basically all the indicators that were, uh, that are present on, that are displayed on the race dashboard can be um, combined and integrated as well with other um, information that is relevant for a particular user to create custom views. So if you, um, I would just, I don't know if you can, if I can switch um, screens here, but you can maybe access later to these um, URLs that are shown on the screen. So basically, um, it's a simple, um, through, through, from the main interface, the user can just select which indicators um, um, he or she wants to add to, to the custom view, and then edit this custom view to include um, additional text or images or whatever descriptions one um, considers to be relevant, and then publish this um, online. And it's a collaborative feature, so two users that have the same edit link can collaborate on it and create their own stories. Uh, I'd like just to end by pointing out that we do have um, challenges open right now. So the latest challenge was open on the 1st of September and it goes on until the 30th of November. Um, it's a three-stage um, challenge. Uh, so the idea is that first um, there is an, let's say the definition of the idea. So indicators that can show um, socioeconomic impacts, that can show um, environmental impacts, um, as well as indicators that can um, help us understand where we stand with respect to the recovery. Uh, so coming back to normality, let's say. And uh, there is as well one theme that is completely open. So um, anyone can, can propose um, indicators that, that have not been um, yet proposed uh, or bring a new idea. So um, in the first stage um, of the challenges uh, is just the idea definition then if this um, idea is pre-selected, then it goes to an upscaling um, stage where the indicator is, been, let's say, being refined and uh, upscaled to the whole of Europe using, of course, the platform technologies that we make available. And the third stage is integration. So the ideas can get integrated, like you've seen the, the ones that I've shown before with the trucks and the flying airplanes, they get integrated into the dashboard. So the resources that we make available 
Uh, first, uh, I'd like to point out that we've, uh, for all the competitions that we've launched before, we've created quite a large um, library of uh, open tutorials, uh, Jupyter notebooks, uh, where the users can replicate um, most of the indicators that are being uh, shown uh, on the platform. So they can um, exercise how to access the data through the Eurodata Cube, how to launch the different processings, use the different APIs, and uh, produce those graphs that you just saw. Um, the pre-configured pre workspace is um, provided by, by our technical team. So I think this is uh, it, uh, all I wanted to present. So I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot for this uh, really excellent presentation. Um, I guess we have a lot of uh, um, questions from the audience, but I'll take the chance to ask the first one. Um, so you showed some really nice examples how you involve the community and uh, basically use their knowledge to um, um, for various purposes. And uh, my question is, um, what challenges did you face um, in managing to involve this community and to really be engaged? Because I'm myself um, uh, trying to involve different um, uh, communities, uh, also indigenous people and so on. And it's always a little bit of a challenge for me how to involve them and motivate them to, uh, to be willing to participate and contribute. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Nicolina, for this question. It's actually, um, it was one of, uh, one of the pain points uh, as well for us. So we, uh, it was, of course, a learning curve. And uh, I have to say that we have, um, let's say, um, a sister um, collaboration with, uh, with NASA and JAXA, the so-called EO dashboard. It is basically um, a second instance of this dashboard, but extended globally, so not just for Europe. And there we collaborated a lot with, uh, with the space apps teams of NASA. So they have um, a global reach. Uh, we had a hackathon this summer that managed to, to create, to, to bring together 500 teams. So about 5,000 participants. Um, for for the European challenges, let's say, so for, for these challenges that we've launched now, um, the first round of challenges that we launched were, um, let's say, quite quite specific and uh, demanding. So what we what we tried to do to to get more more participation from the public is to open up the themes a bit, so not to make it so restrictive, and to um, to provide as many resources as possible. So now for this round of challenges, we have created a detailed technical guide um, that shows the participants how they can access all the resources, where they can find the data, what this data is about, how it was processed, um, how they can interact with the tool. So documentation was one of the things that we, we learned was useful. And um, providing the participants as well with the opportunity to ask us questions. So that's why also in the fee week, uh, in the side event that we, we have on the 15th, we invite those that have subscribed, that have signed up for the challenges to come and to ask us questions, uh, try to validate their idea. And uh, so basically promoting this dialogue with, with the experts. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess we can proceed with the questions uh, from the audience. Awesome. <clears throat> Excuse me, great presentation, Anka. Really interesting platform. I'm excited to play around with it. Um, when we finish this, the phosphor sheet. Um, one of the questions from the audience is that this platform seems quite relevant beyond the scope of the pandemic. Are there plans to continue maintaining and developing it in the future? Thanks, that's, that's really a great question. And um, yes, we are actually in process of, of evolving, let's say this platform, especially the trilateral cooperation with NASA and JAXA. So we're, uh, we have extended this international cooperation for, uh, for the next year as well and uh, are looking to go beyond, hopefully, <laughs> COVID will end uh, sometime soon. So um, we're looking to address different, more environmental and climate-focused uh, themes. So yes, it's ongoing. That sounds excellent. Um, really good news. Um, another question for you, um, how is the indicator calculated? Is it through the dashboard or is it fetched from another um, data source? I, I guess kind of on the fly versus something stored? Yeah, so uh, some of the indicators are calculated on the fly. 
So those um, time series that are computed from the maps, uh, for example, for the air quality, they're calculated on the fly based on the, basically there is an averaging done on the area of interest that is uh, defined by the user. But other indicators are um, calculated, um, let's say outside of the platform and they're just accessed uh, by the platform. So they're regularly updated. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Um, another question on the chat here. Um, is there any information on the gendered impact of COVID-19 available through the platform and through gender disaggregated data? That's a great question. Uh, we haven't addressed this topic yet, um, but um, in the um, hackathon that I um, was talking about a bit before, uh, so the um, EO dashboard hackathon with uh, with our NASA and JAXA, JAXA colleagues, um, we received um, a large number of, um, of different ideas, and some of those were addressing not necessarily gender, uh, um, gender differentiated impact of COVID-19, but uh, they were looking at um, different, um, let's say, uh, vulnerable populations. So um, uh, looking at, there was one team that submitted a proposal, um, an idea on um, indigenous um, populations or the impact for, of the COVID on ind indigenous population. Excellent, really interesting. Um, those are all the questions that, that I see now um, in the chat. If there's any others from the listeners, please feel free to pop those in. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, I, I will admit that gender question is mine. I'm curious, I, I haven't had a chance to play around with the, the platform yet, but is there any kind of <clears throat> data sets in there that um, do have either gender or um, uh, vulnerable population data sets, like um, the differences in male-female uh, mobility or um, indigenous groups or other minority groups? Um, so there are several data sources that are not really open. Um, I'm thinking now of the mobile analytics data. So that one is as much as possible anonymized uh, and was used mostly to um, to describe the impact on agricultural uh, production or agriculture output. So uh, basically the information uh, was, or the, the relevant information was whether there was available workforce on the fields or not. So without discriminating between the different genders. Uh, the types of socioeconomic data that we include are just population data, so population density, which is really aggregated, so we can, cannot really disentangle those um, that, at that level. Uh, but um, we do have, uh, so we do encourage contributions. So if you have ideas of what kind of data could be relevant for this, uh, there is also a feedback button on the platform, so you can send us our feedback directly from there and uh, just submit a proposal of what data you, you would find relevant and would be happy to have a look at that. Great, thank you so much.